guys. And there's an old Chinese adage that if the artist does not feel excited or sad or happy when he's drawing the picture, he has no right to expect the audience to feel those emotions. You have to invest a work of art with a degree of intensity, an intensity of feeling upon your part, in order for that to communicate. Well, come on, I mean, what makes you special? I mean, you're just a jerk like everybody else. What makes you think that you know what's going on? I know as well as anybody else is what is going on, that all that anybody upon this particular planet can do, finding themselves surrounded by a web of information, much of which might be untrue, some of which may be valid, they have to make up their own mind. They have to think as much as they can about what is right, try to work out what courses of action seem to be the most pro-survival, which courses of action are going to make things a little bit better and certainly not hurt anybody else. As somebody who lived through the latter part of the 60s and the early 70s, obviously I believe that people's minds can be changed that if you shout about something vehemently enough, it might make a difference. It is obviously a very big factor if you're planning a power plant, just what the political consensus is in the area where you're planning to build it. If there are an awful lot of people who are fanatically anti-nuclear, it might just be better to sort of leave that area alone and build it somewhere else. There is no doubt about it that this is an element in 1980s politics that if you're going to have to go through a massive fight with local protest groups, you can add another half million onto your costs. It hits people in the wallet, which, I mean, like, I think that really it would be naive to expect to sort of uh, hit them in the conscience. Hey guys, welcome back from our Papa Moore. More from Papa Moore. Um, it's interesting, actually, before we get into issue eight... Uh, I want to talk to you about how yesterday I had, we were just talking about like left brain, right brain stuff. And uh, yesterday I was trying to explain to this man who did not believe that comics had any value. <laughs> he, had, he believed there was no value in comics. Um, I, I went to check out this apartment for a friend and I met the apartment manager, property manager. Somehow, I tr I triggered him. I did trigger him. It wasn't on purpose. It wasn't intentional, but I triggered him, and he got really upset, and he started going off about all sorts of things, and um, we were talking about comic books, and I was just like, he was just like, thinks that they're just trash. Like, he just thinks that, he just thought they were just, like, such trash and so lowbrow, and, um, and I was just like, dude, I was like, this stuff is really good for your brain because it activates both the left side and and the right side of your brain, okay? Because you're reading text, but you're also looking at color and line, you know, and form. And these two things together, you know, evoke this response, you know? And it's just like, how cool is it? It's like, you know, it's like reading a movie. I don't know, like, but people think that just because comic books have pictures are for like stupid people or something, I think. And it's like, I think that reading with images is really, it's very pleasurable for my brain. Like my brain really enjoys reading comics because it, it does work both sides. And I think that that's more balanced. And that's like, I'm always trying to find more balance because I'm a very imbalanced individual. So I'm always trying to look for that. So comics is something that does that for me. Did you tell him you were gonna give him a copy of Watchmen? I did, I threatened him with a copy of Watchmen because um, he was a reader. Because I did, I ended up asking him, I was like, dude, what? what's your art? Like, what are you into? You know, and he's like, what? And I was like, are you into like, movies or music or like reading or what's your thing and he was like oh i'm into reading and i was like oh okay and i was just like well i was like i really think that you would like the watchman because i told him about my book club and he also told me the internet was trash too so i was just like i was like no it's not like i'm reading the watchman with thousands of people online it's really important um i want to find out what he approves of then um yeah he was not he was not about the internet culture thing um but okay uh well okay real quick how did i trigger him uh no courts wants to know okay well look i don't have my ringer on most of the time and i do not answer phone calls if i don't know the number generally speaking uh i don't even 
I don't know. Just text me. You know, I'm one of those millennials that you see. No voicemail either. Zen, although I think I'm technically millennial. But yeah, and I so much, and I don't, I don't like voicemail. I hate fucking voicemail. I've always hated voicemail, and so I just never got my voicemail set up on my phone. So people don't even have the fucking option to leave me a fucking message because I don't want to deal with it. And so this guy had called me earlier in the day and I was asleep and I didn't pick it up and I didn't hear it and uh, and he couldn't leave me a message and he got upset. So when I walked into this apartment, he was like, you know, well, so, uh, you know, do you not have a voicemail set up? And I immediately knew that he was what exactly was going on, how, why he was upset. And I immediately was just like, Hey man, I'm just one of those millennial people that just, I just don't talk. I don't take phone calls really. I just prefer texts. Uh, you know, I don't have my ringer on very much. Uh, that's just not really something that I, I deal with. Uh, I just try, I don't like doing it. And he was like, well, she tried to like kind of hit me with logic of, well, that's stupid because, you know, he was trying, without saying it, he was trying to tell me that's stupid because you're going to miss a call that you need and sometimes people need to talk to you with information. This is something my father and mother have both told me and I know this. And, and I told him, I was like, I'm not saying it's right, bro. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying this is what I do. You know, like I'm not defending myself. No, it is right. It's no. the right thing to do. Well, it's you not. Don't just anybody calling you anytime. It's not right or wrong, you know, is and the thing. It's just like, this is how I am. It's not personal. How about that? It's not personal. It's not personal, bro, but he took it very personally. And so then it was like, I was a bit, like, I, I became a symbol of every annoying millennial f article that this older white man has read. And he was so bummed. He was just so bummed on. And then I was like, I work on the internet and I talk about comics. And he was like, oh God, oh, she's the worst. Oh, and her fucking green hair. And I look like an asshole. I had this like really cute green sweater on. And like, it's just like trust. I wasn't even wearing the craziest stuff. I wasn't even wearing my asshole stuff. I was like actually pretty conservative that day, but I could tell he was just bummed. But I let him kind of like talk shit to me for like 20 minutes. And then I listened and I occasionally kind of called him on a certain a few shenanigan things that he said I was like ah that's that's kind of that's a lot to say that but um whatever that's neither here nor there it's totally weird I'm still processing it <laughs> I'm still processing it I got slimed I feel like I got emotionally slimed but I was just like that's my that's this thing shit this happens to me more than you'd think okay people say crazy shit to me and unload on me and vent on me strangers strangers that I don't know and I just, I recognize that that's part of my function. And so I just kind of, now I understand what's going on when it happens. And so I just let it happen. And I just go, okay, okay. You know, and I let them, let them get, just fucking do whatever they need to do. And I usually need to take a salt water bath though after. Uh, so yeah. Oh, thanks for resubscribing, holy man. Uh, all right. So let's move on to issue eight recap of old ghosts. In this issue, we explore cycles of violence on a Halloween night. Hollis Mason and Sally Jupiter discuss the recent reappearance of their namesakes Night Owl and Silk Spectre on the scene. We also get more tales from the Black Freighter. Dan and Lori continue to strategize how they're going to bust Rorschach out of jail before he meets with a bloody end. Meanwhile, Rorschach sits in isolation after his incident of throwing hot fat onto another inmate in self-defense. And he is visited by an old enemy, Big Figure, who promises Kovacs retribution. Police visit Dan to let him know that they know that he was behind the recent tenement fire save and to stay grounded or else, spurring Dan and Lori into action. Emotions come to a head when the inmate, in, when the inmate Rorschach attacked dies and Sing Sing erupts into chaos. In a beautiful parallel, one night owl descends into the madness to rescue a brother from a prison riot. The other night owl prepares for a quiet night in, but chaos comes to find him anyways. Lori and Dan locate and fly off with Rorschach after he takes care of Big Figure and regroup at Dan's place. John reappears and takes Lori with him to Mars. Rorschach and Night Owl escape before police can catch them. Meanwhile, Street punks, moved by the spirit of 77, bust in on Hollis Mason for a bit of the old ultra-violence, and he is murdered with an award in the shape of himself presented to him the night that he officially retired. All right, 
So we're talking a lot about cycles of violence. We're also talking about just cycles in general. Like you have Night Owl uh, and then Night Owl 1, Hollis Mason. And then he is followed up by a kind of surrogate son, if you will, Dan Dryberg, who takes up his namesake and he becomes Night Owl 2. Now, Sally Jupiter, she was Silk Spectre, and then she has a daughter, so she has a, an actual daughter, and then she forces her actual daughter to take up her namesake, Silk Spectre 2. And I love the opening scene in, let's go to our book cam. I love our opening scene here where we have Hollis and he's talking to Sally over the phone. And they're talking about, I was like, oh, did you hear? You know, did you hear? Like, Dan's, uh... Night Owl's back in action, sounds like, and it sounds like Lori's fucking hanging out with him. And, uh, and she's, I love that, uh, Sally's like, my Lori? My Lori? Is that she thought she hated this stuff, you know? And also, I love that, uh, you know, he's like, yeah, Lori's hanging out with Dan now. And she's like, oh, Jesus, that's quick work, you know? Like, oh, so good. Her mom's just, like, calling her out, you know? She just totally sees it. Um... But I love, like, the difference between them where it's like, okay, so he's in New York and this, uh, living above a garage, you know, in this grimy New York. And she's out in California. Um, but they're both still, like, they have this perfect juxtaposition. I mean, they're always juxtaposing everything in this comic. And so these two characters are being juxtaposed. And you see him and, like, he has his statue and he's thinking about his time as, as the night owl and how that was just a high point in his life. I mean, that's such a high it's such a fucking high to be, I mean, it's really like, it's just drugs. Like being a superhero is like being on drugs. And so, and it's like, nothing can ever top that. Um, but even though like, and she has, okay, so he has his like little award in the shape of himself and she has a nostalgia bottle. So it's like, they're both, you know, like have those, think of like reminisce about the old times. Um, and I do like the joke that she puts in there where he's like, she's like, you mean that you had my number this whole time? And you're just now using it in our sunset years. Like, you're just now using it. She's such a flirt. Like, even as an old lady, she's just like, she's such a flirt. I love Silk Spectre 1. She just cracks me up so much. Um, also, I love, uh, let's see here. I love Rorschach being, like, Dan's crazy ex, you know? Like... I really realized this. Like, Rorschach is Dan's crazy ex who, like, shows up you know, in the house, and you told him, please don't show up here. Please stop showing up here. You know, like, please stop. And, like, he keeps showing up and is even, like, stealing, eating his food and taking his sugar cubes, you know. We talked about that last time where uh, they found sugar cubes in his pockets when he was, when he was uh, taken in by police, Rorschach. And he got those sugar cubes from Dan's house because he's, like, living like a homeless person, so he just kind of takes whatever when he's hanging out. And, uh, I don't know, I just think it's really cute how he's, like, he is his crazy ex, and, like, he feels like, he's like, oh, like, I know he's crazy, but I still love him, you know? Like, I know he's crazy, but I still love him, and I gotta, like, help him out. I gotta help a brother out. Uh, and it's like, yeah, that's, that's a whole, that's a whole thing. Like, that's, I love that. Um, I had a lot of fun with the New Frontiersmen. We had a lot of New Frontiersmen stuff in this issue. Uh, and also, we get to see Max Shea. So, this artist, let's go to our book cam. So, over here, we have the New Frontiersman. Okay, and the New Frontiersman is the alt, <laughs> alt-right, I should just say right-wing, ultra-right-wing uh, conspiracy journal that Rorschach likes to read, he subscribes to. Okay, and then, um, so they're like putting together their headline and you see that this guy is like trying to, the Nova Express recently had a smear campaign, which is like a rival of theirs, but they're like a corporate news media thing. Uh, they have, you know, fucked up Dr. Manhattan and got him like in, you know, exiled himself, you know, it's like they sprung this whole thing on him. And so this guy is having this reactionary piece to it. And he's over here and he's like putting together his thing, you know, and he's just like, oh, gosh, I need help with this. And he's like, he's openly racist, like he's a piece of shit, you know. But at the same time, it's like it's so perfect, like how um, that you see that this guy isn't corporate news media, you know, like this guy is like one dude 
who is kind of a piece of shit and he's kind of a racist, but you know, he's got his, this is his thing and no one's influencing him what to say. And he says whatever he wants and his stuff. And, uh, and because of that, it's like, he's able to find certain pieces of the truth. And I think it's really interesting how you have like in the supplemental at the end, um, let's just like, just skip to that shit. Cause this is just too good. I really like the news media stuff in this. Like there's just so much goodness going on. Um, at the very end, like, you know, honor is like a hawk. Sometimes it must go hooded, you know, and he's exclaiming over how excited he's like, I've really got a good headline, you know, like how exciting it is to have a good headline and how he's just capturing the spirit of everything that's going on. And it's so cool how this is like talking about this is like taking place on Halloween, you know, and it's like this is when the spirits come back, you know, like spirits come back on Halloween. They cycle back around. And so, you know, he is seeing like this. um this spirit that's going on, you know, and he's like hopping on and, and like using it as well. And it's just like everything is coming to a head. Uh, and I love that in this publication, I mean, there's stuff that's like absolutely the truth. Like some of the questions that this crazy man has are absolutely good questions, you know, like he has, he absolutely has a part of the truth. Uh, and if you get past the emotionalism of him as a person, of him being a piece of shit, you know, it's like, and you listen to what he's actually saying, it's like, okay, like, there's some good stuff in there. Um, I mean, he's talking about, like, who stands to benefit, who stands, um, he's like, I've had it up to here with these coked out commie cowards, and I think it's time we started to ask ourselves just who stands to benefit most from Nova Express's ridiculing of American legends and the subsequent subversion and undermining of our national morale. Can there be any doubt of the only beneficiary is the cause of international communism? Should we not perhaps call upon our authorities to take a closer look at exactly who is funding this pernicious piece of propaganda? And it's like... I mean, he's a crazy person, but I mean, that's a good question. Who is funding these motherfuckers? And that's a question that Dan brings up earlier with Lori. You know, I mean, he's like, look at this. Like, if you look, the people who work at Nova Express, you know, all used to work at this other place. They used to be funded by all this other stuff. And if you look at this corporate web, like he's sitting here looking at this and like, there's some weird shit going on. You know, like there's absolutely some weird shit going on. And so I think that this is like such a really special lesson about how to separate the wheat from the chaff. Like that's something that I think that isn't talked about enough is that especially in this age where there's so much data being thrown at you, there's so many words or so many articles or so many people trying to pull you in all these different directions, trying to get your attention. Um, and you got to be like aware of this stuff and you have to learn how to like become detached to a point where that you can look at something see the emotional side of it like you can have your emotional reactions to it but know that like those are separate and also look at it with a more critical eye uh, and through that you can find the truth and i think that nobody has a monopoly on the truth you know uh i feel like i mean a lot of publications religions leaders ideologies everyone claims to have this monopoly on the truth uh and that's nobody has monopoly on the truth but everybody i believe does have a piece of it you know, we all have pieces, we all have little pieces of the truth and we don't necessarily know uh, what we have, you know, we don't, and we don't know which truth is like, you know, it's like this guy's just spouting all sorts of nonsense, but some of that stuff in there is really valuable and, uh, and it's up to you to learn how to look through those things, you know, look at these headlines, look at these clickbait articles. Like I have one friend in particular, and I think this is like the right way, like, you know, talking about news and talking about the media. I think the right way to deal with the news and with media is to sample a lot of different sources. I think that if you kind of look at the right sources and you look at the left sources and you look at the middle sources and you look, you just have a nice smattering of everybody and you're kind of looking, sometimes you'll see a through line, right, within all of these where it's like, okay, this actually happened, you know, like, because they'll all report on a specific thing. You're like, okay, well, this probably actually happened. Um, and you can find the truth yourself, but you do have to scan through a lot of different, uh, a lot of different sources. You can't just use one source. I mean, that's what they taught you in school, right? I mean, when you're, when you're writing a, when you're writing a piece, 
You can't just cite one source. You gotta have a lot of different sources. You have to have done your research. You gotta look around before you can say that you formed an opinion, you know? So I think that was really cool. I really like that aspect of this, uh, of this issue. Um, I, ugh, the new Frontiersman is so fascinating, especially right now. I mean, with all of the fake news and right and left and like everybody else. Um, thank you, Z Smith. Uh, yeah, like it's, it's so relevant to right now. And I think, but I think the thing is, that's really interesting is I have, I know a lot of different types of people. I know a lot of different types of people. Um, and so, and I get a lot of different, I see a lot of different people's thoughts and feelings like on my, on my Facebook and on my social media. And I see these things, you know, and I watch these people and, um, I don't know, you can learn a lot from listening to the other side, you know? I absolutely have friends that are super right-wing, I have friends who are super left-wing, I've got, every, again, everyone in between. And listening to both extremes, I've learned a lot, um, but I've also learned that generally, it's like, if you listen to the left's super extreme stuff, and then you listen to the right's super extreme stuff, again, just try to find, like, the similar stuff, and then, like, somewhere in the middle is usually what actually kind of happened, but then again, you'll never even really fucking know, you know, I have a hard time with news and media in general, because it's just, like, I don't know if any of this shit happened, you know, it says, it says that it happened, but was I there? No. Well, this could be a total, everything, anything could be a total fabrication, you have to take everything with a grain of salt. Most people only well, yeah, a lot of a lot of people do listen to try to listen to kind of one source or one type of information, and yeah, it's important to kind of to get a smattering to look all over and kind of see what's out there. Um, but okay, so back to it. Um, I love also. Okay, we got to go back to our book cam because there's some really cool art stuff that I was really excited by. Okay. So I really enjoyed when they're getting ready to bust Rorschach out. So they start doing this thing where you have the six panels up here and then the two, two panels down here. So this takes up like these big panels. And I love that in all of this, like while they're getting ready to bust Rorschach out of jail, Lori is present. She's driving him. She's totally like, yes, let's do this. And it's so funny because he used to be partnered up with like Rorschach, who's also crazy. Like he needs, he needs a crazy person in his life, you know? And so you have her and she's like, oh yeah, here we go. All right, what about this? And then she's even shown fueling up the Archimedes tank, like putting the little, although it's not fuel, they have electric stuff. I like that in this future, everything's electric. Like the, if you guys have noticed, the, the cars and stuff are electric now. Um... <laughs> So I love that, yeah, you see her and she's totally like fueling up the deal. And then you see her here with him. They're together. She's not sitting over here. She's over here. She's over here. And then they're going, you know, oh, I just, I really love the pacing of this, how this turned out. I think it's just so pretty. Um, and then there she is. There is like her hand is over his shoulder. Like she's just totally behind this motherfucker and his craziness. You know, this guy was doing perfectly fine. And then this woman shows up and now look at him. He's fucking busting into prisons. He's fucking doing crazy shit. Like it's so great. Um, relationships are fun guys. <laughs> yeah. I mean, do you guys have any relationships like that where you just, you have that other person and they just like, yeah, you know, they drive you and then you guys end up doing just crazy, pulling crazy stunts together. I feel like, I feel like I have a little bit of that going on in my life. I got a little bit, I got a little, I went, when I was reading this, I'm not going to lie, I was like, Tyson, was, I, I see a little bit of, a little bit of uh, T-Bone in Dan, a little bit that he's like a good guy and he's like, he's like Batman and he likes to build stuff. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, he's got his little cave, he's all his computers, his monitors. Oh, my God, it was so good. So good. Um, I did like Lori a lot more. I'm sorry. Like I know, I know. Dude, I was, I was joking because, like, T-Bone had, like, read the issue, and I was like, I was like, oh, my God. Like, when she hit the button and then there was a fire everywhere, I was like, yeah, that's exactly why I don't touch your computers and stuff. Like, I just stay the fuck away. Like, I don't, I have my own computer and I touch my computer and I just pretty much stay away from all the other stuff, the other tech stuff, because I will just press the wrong button and fuck it up. I'll fuck it up real fast. Uh, <laughs> I'm a chaos being, okay? That's what I do. Uh, that's what I do. 
Uh, I also, okay, another fun thing that I noticed when, okay, so they bust Rorschach out of jail, which was so much fun. I mean, everybody, did we all have fun? Yes. Yay. We all had fun with the fucking busting out of jail. And I love that, like, Rorschach just, like, doesn't get, like, he's just so at home in chaos. Like, he just doesn't give a fuck. Like, he, has, he gives zero fucks. He's just, like, gives zero fucks. He's in chaos. He's, in, he's taking his time. He's gonna, you know, he's not worried. He's not sweating it. He's got these dudes that are just like, oh, yeah, we're gonna fucking do this horrible shit to you. He didn't give a fuck. Um, and when they bust him out and he goes into the, they don't know that he's killing that little dude in the bathroom. And she's like, oh, are you sure you're ready to go? Being sarcastic. And he's just like, oh, yeah, good advice. You know, like gives her some weird response. It was so good. Uh, I really enjoyed that a lot. Um, but they go back to regroup at uh, John's house. And let's go to our book camp. All right, so we, she, they go to John's house, or Dan's house, sorry. They go to Dan's house, and they're like, okay, we got to get our shit and get out of here because they were totally in trouble because, <laughs> like, we just busted Rorschach out of jail. And John's there. And, uh, and John and Lori, like, they still have unresolved business is the thing. It's like, yeah, they broke up, but they didn't talk about it, really. I mean, it's just like they kind of had their fight, and then that was it. They didn't have, like, they haven't finished it you know they haven't finished kind of like said the the things that they need to say and so john shows up and he's like hey you know come on let's get out of here but i love that in this panel she's like john oh jesus i mean you know and it's like calls says john oh jesus followed by john oh jesus so it's like okay and then later she he asked her something else and she goes god yes yes and it's like She's addressed him twice, like once as Jesus and once as God. I know it's supposed to be like colloquial, but like that's not how Alan Moore means it. It's like she starts saying this, you know, taking the Lord's name in vain because she's around this being who is like, is as a God. And I thought that was really cool. I was like, yes, I totally picked up on that one. Uh, really enjoyed that one. Also, the other thing, uh, I love that we talked about the calendar calendar in this where you have when the policeman's over at dan's house and he's like oh you ever look at the you look at the next month of the calendar you ever do that you know oh this is, this is what i do i look at the next month and it's like he looks at the next month and it goes from an owl to a hawk catching a sparrow in mid-flight you know and later on uh when they go back to dan's place like uh lori like pins it up and it's like the hawk coming in uh, and I was just like, oh, that's such good foreshadowing. That fucking calendar image is such good fucking foreshadowing. It's like, I don't want to, I can't talk about it. We'll talk about it later, you know, because I don't want to like spoilers for people who haven't finished reading. I don't want to talk about it. But I feel like that's so fucking good, you know. It just made me so happy. It made me so happy seeing that hawk and the sparrow. I have so much to talk about it later. Uh, we'll come back to that. Um, yeah. And then, um, yeah, I guess that's it for, for that, guys. We're going to start taking some questions pretty soon. Uh, I'm going to take a break first, and then I will be right back. You can take a break. You want to go grab some food? Why don't you, yeah. play that other Alan Moore clip? Uh, you know what? We'll play one more Alan Moore clip. There is a red and angry world. Red things happen there. The world eats your wife, eats your friends, eats all the things that make you human. And you become a monster. And the world just keeps on eating. The original Swamp Thing was portrayed as a man who somehow had turned into this weird hybrid plant creature. When I took over in 82, I decided to change it around. What I did was to make it a plant with delusions of grandeur, a plant that had somehow managed to convince itself that it was a human being. And having done that, I found that I'd got a character with possibilities that went far beyond those of the general mainstream of comics characters. The issues that Swamp Thing deals with are ones that are very rarely touched upon in other comics. I stand in an orchard of street signs and parking meters. 
From across the wilderness city, the wind blows fragments of music, percussive, robotic, distant. My consciousness seeps out through the filaments and shoots. In Coventry, the residents' protection group creep through an overgrown department store, bristling with guns and tension. In the cosmetics department, an escaped tiger treads carefully through the spilled lipsticks. In one episode of Swamp Thing, we had an entire tropical rainforest bursting up through the streets of New York and smothering the city in vegetation. In the resultant chaos and carnage, all of the animals escaped from the local zoo so that you have parakeets roosting on top of street lamps and escaped tigers padding through the cosmetics department of the local chain store. What we were trying to suggest is that even though mankind can cover nature and smother the wilderness with a layer of concrete and cement, even though mankind can erect huge, powerful and impressive looking buildings, that underneath our feet, underneath the buried pipes and the buried cables, nature is still there. The wilderness is still there. And though man might boast of having conquered nature, that's not the case. For if nature were to shrug or to merely raise its eyebrow, then we should all be gone. since the Industrial Revolution. We've had a situation where you almost get mankind pitted against the environment. If you hear the way that people have talked about the relationship between man and nature, it's been in terms of man triumphing over nature, of man beating back nature and imposing his own will upon the natural world. We are incredibly arrogant about the planet that we're living on. We somehow assume that we can do anything to the world and it will always be there and it will always look after us and that's not the case. It's okay ignoring that stuff because it's too depressing or too frightening. It's okay ignoring wiping out of various species because, well, you know, I mean, what's a panda or two between friends? Do the blue whales really matter to us that much? This organism that we're living on, this planet, is so incredibly finely balanced that whatever befalls the Earth befalls the sons of the earth. If you spit upon the earth, you spit upon mankind. favourite sequences in Swamp Thing is uh, where he realises that with all of his vast powers he could actually do something towards saving the world. I could do it. Could restore Africa's crumbling topsoil to the loam from which rich jungle sprang. And why stop there? Why not rebuild the forests of the Amazon, less green now than an average suburbia and shrinking by the day? I could drop grapes into the mouths of all the hungry children, turn the Gobi and Sahara into green and rippling meadows, give the widows roses and the old men strawberries. For am I not a god? I could touch all this world with wilderness as I touch Gotham, could transform this planet to a sphere of perfumes, colours and full bellies. I could save mankind. I could do anything. Anything. But of course, once he's considered all the implications, Swamp Thing does nothing, coming to the following conclusions. Is this then what it is to be a god? To know and never do? To watch the world wind by and in its windings find content? If I should feed the world, heal all the wounds man's smouldering industries have made, what would he do? Would he renounce the wealth his sawmills bring? Step gently on the flowers instead and pluck each apple with respect for this abundant world in all its providence. No. He would pump more poisons, build more mines, safe in the knowledge that I stood on hand to mend the biosphere, endlessly covering the scars he could now endlessly inflict.
the world at the moment seems to be a bit of a runaway train. It's getting faster and faster and faster. Nobody has got the faintest idea what the hell is going on. But one thing that is certain is that it's all changing, and it's changing really, really rapidly. And you've got kids who are supposed to make some sense of this huge and imposing world that's looming over us when they've barely been able to make sense of the world that we've had for the past 20 years. And to do that, I don't really think personally the education system's up to it. What I think is that people these days get their information from all of the, the much despised sort of vulgar media sources that people have been trying so hard to ban for the past 40 years. Television, movies, comics, rock and roll records. That is the main way that kids sort of soak up all this info. So if in these sort of basically silly sort of funny books and things I can actually get over some information, if I can help the education process in a, in a bright four-colour comic book way that kids are actually going to want to read, then I'd say that's enough of a contribution. If I thought I'd done that, I think I'd be happy. Oh, yeah. Papa Moore. I love those. It look, It's not quite clout goggles, but it looks like he's wearing clout goggles. He totally looks like he's wearing those clout goggles, those white frames. I love it. Um, yeah, it's kind of embarrassing. Honestly, I've, I've haven't read Swamp Thing yet. I know I need to do it. I know, I know. Uh, Swamp Thing Club. I know everyone's gonna say Swamp Thing Club, but I, you know, I think it would be interesting though to do a book club about something that I haven't read before and just kind of discover as we go along. That could be interesting, but also I'm still trying to kind of iron out the kinks of what I'm already doing. So before we make it even harder on myself, um, but yeah, I gotta read Swamp Thing. It's on my list of things to do. Now. We're going to come back for the, uh, we're going to come back and we're going to do some Q&As. We're going to do some Q&As. Um, before we go, by the way, guys, if you're interested, Watchman Club is sponsored by me and these Watchman Club t-shirts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right here. Um, wait, what? Do we... Store webpage. Oh, store page. Yeah. Okay, so check it out. Uh, we just made it available. So if you guys want to grab one of these Watchman Club t-shirts, uh, check it out. You can get one now. It's super sick. Uh, it's awesome. I made sure I had my dude. He sent me like all these different. Um, he sent me all these different T-shirts, and I tried on these three different T-shirts and went with the next level. I'm really excited. I think this is a really good T-shirt. Uh, it feels really good. It's, I did not go with the cheapest T-shirt. Thank you. You're welcome, <laughs> Gildan. Get out. Uh, <laughs> no thanks. Well, actually, some of the although I was impressed, he did send me like a better Gildan. I was like, this is way better than it used to be. Um, I used to airbrush t-shirts, so I know, I don't know, I know about t-shirt brands. But, um, but yeah, so uh, bigcartel.com, if you want to support the class, you can get one of these. And also, for a limited time, you get a robot comedian patch, comes free with it, so you can iron it on. We're going to do our iron-on uh, deal pretty soon, where I'm going to teach you guys how to iron on your robot comedian patch on your, on your Watchman Club shirt. So uh, that's really exciting. Also, uh, thank you, Call Me Treasure Hunter, for subscribing. Really appreciate your subscription. Um, all right. So before we get into our Q&As, I am going to end this stream, and then we're going to begin a new stream. So uh, if you have some questions, get them ready, and I will see you in uh, just a few seconds.